Hello and welcome everybody um, to Network 2020's briefing on US-China diplomacy, as well as the first in our webinars and our deep dive program. Uh, so for those who are joining today, I'm just going to give a quick overview of Network 2020, uh, as well as this deep dive program. So, so Network 2020, our mission is really to educate and inform emerging and established leaders about international affairs. We run a number of different programs and this briefing is part of our deep dive program, which provides an opportunity for participants to get a multi-layered understanding of an issue critical to international affairs. And in the past, we have run these programs in person. So this most recent iteration is our first foray, foray into taking the deep dive into the virtual world. And so we encourage you to participate and make it a success. So we will have a series of six publicly available webinars such as this one, covering diplomacy, economics, defense, domestic politics, and other topics about China. And for $50, and this is included in membership for all of those who are already members, we will have two discussion groups with experts and a lot of helpful and carefully curated prep materials. And for those who are non-members who sign up for this, you will also get an annual virtual membership as well. So please, I encourage you all to sign up. Uh, so as the news underscores, understanding China couldn't be more important. Today, President Biden is in San Diego to meet with the UK and Australian leaders to discuss a submarine deal designed to shore up naval forces in the Pacific as deterrence to China. And on Friday, the reestablishment of diplomatic ties between US friend and foe, Saudi Arabia and Iran respectively, was announced from Beijing, which brokered the talks and opens a new chapter in China's role on the world stage. So here today to help us understand the dynamics and trajectory of relations between China and the United States is Susan Thornton. Susan is currently a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School. And this is following a distinguished career in the foreign service where she served as acting assistant secretary of state for East Asia and Pacific during the first 18 months of the Trump administration. Among other accomplishments, she structured the administration's initial approach to China and developed the administration's landmark approach to the Indo-Pacific. Not on her bio or the years she served as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Turkmenistan, where I had the great pleasure of working with her. So Susan, welcome back to Network 2020. It's nice to see you again. Thanks, great to be uh, with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, kicking us off today. So the US-China relationship has been in the news a lot recently. How would you characterize the recent developments that you're seeing and their immediate impact on U.S.-China relations? Well, thanks, Courtney. I mean, it's really important, I think, that we have this discussion today and we think hard and deeply, as in your deep dive series, about the U.S. relationship with China, where we are at the moment and where we're going. Um, I guess in the First instance, we should talk about where we are so that we can all level set where we're starting from. Um, so, you know, the last couple of months have been pretty eventful. In November, President Biden was able to finally sit down with President Xi Jinping of China in Bali, Indonesia, on the margins of the G20 Leaders Summit. That was the first time that the two leaders had been able to meet in person, although they'd had a couple of phone calls before that. Um, and you know, this meeting uh, was supposed to be a way of restabilizing US-China ties. Uh, there were a number of things that were put forward on both sides um, and there were, fairly positive statements coming out from that meeting um, about the intention to try to find a floor in the relationship so that the relations wouldn't keep spiraling downward and become even more fraught and dangerous. Um, and one of the biggest outcomes from that meeting was that Tony Blinken was supposed to go to China um, for a visit, his first, the, his first visit as Secretary of State to China and the first visit by a Secretary of State from the US to China in five years. Um, but unfortunately, 
uh, as many of us probably have become aware, uh, the uh, appearance of this giant uh, spy balloon, as it's been called, over the northern part of the United States um, and the ensuing kind of reactions to that, um, both sort of political reactions, but also military reactions, um, the shooting down of the balloon over the ocean off South Carolina, the ensuing fracas between the U.S. and China, um, you know, really uh, has now kind of as one small incident that will probably not be remembered in the annals of history, really sabotage kind of any attempts that were going to be made to put things in on a more stable track. Uh, Tony Blinken canceled his visit to China. Um, the Chinese sort of made a lot of um, statements about the U.S. overreaction to the spy balloon business. The U.S. put forward demands about, you know, China must promise never to send any more balloons over the United States. And Tony Blinken and his counterpart, um, or one of his counterparts, Wang Yi, met on the margins of a meeting in Germany, which was a very acrimonious meeting um, and basically came to no meeting of the minds. In fact, there in Munich, there were more mutual recriminations over um, potential, US, uh, potential Chinese support to Russia in its war on Ukraine, the US publicly warning China, which is fairly unprecedented, um, warning China not to sell or deliver any lethal assistance to Russia. Chinese maintain they're not doing that, et cetera. So things have really deteriorated in the last couple of months and there doesn't seem to be any plan for any uh, diplomacy with China on the horizon on the part of the United States, at least bilateral meetings. Um, and I would say that you know, even the top level now communication between the two presidents has been put in jeopardy. Um, you know, there was this very odd moment in Biden's State of the Union address where he almost taunted Xi Jinping by name in the speech, saying, um, you know, what world leader would want to change places with Xi Jinping? Name me one, name me one. This did not go down well in Beijing. And um, now we've seen in recent days, Xi Jinping has named the US um, in a public speech as the leader of a containment strategy to block China's economic development, which doesn't sound like much to an American ear given the discourse and rhetoric in this country, but for Chinese to name a country or a leader is very unusual and significant. So uh, at the moment, we hear that maybe Biden wants to make a phone call to Xi Jinping. We also hear that Chinese aren't very excited to talk to President Biden at the moment. And this means basically that, you know, all communication in an official way has has been has been interrupted and there's no clear way of getting it back on track at this point. As follow up, uh, you know you've you've been a diplomat for for decades. You you know China very very well. If you could just help explain to our audience, on the one hand, we had this um, what looked like some positive steps in a direction in November, um, and then on the other hand, you had the spy boom, spy balloon incident, um, and you know the concern over arms sales to Russia. Um, is diplomacy predicated on trust or is there something else going on here? Because for, for people observing, they might just say, well, you know, we, we can't move forward in a positive relationship if we don't have trust. And it seems like that trust wasn't there of China saying one thing and then doing another. How, how would you respond to that? Um... Yeah, I think what most people would say about diplomacy between major powers is that, um, you know, you can't really base it on so-called trust. And I mean, there's different ideas maybe of what that word means, but uh, basically there has to be a certain amount of credibility 
um, that what you're saying means something. And I think at the moment between the US and China, China believes that what the US says doesn't mean anything in terms of the actions they see coming from the US. They think there's a huge disconnect between what, for example, President Biden said in Bali and then what uh, subsequent actions the US has been taking with respect to China. And on the other hand, I think the US views China the same way. We see China saying, we're not gonna deliver lethal assistance to Russia. Um, and then we see what we think are indications that maybe China is actually thinking about doing that. So, you know, this is the game that's being played. And I mean, in other times, earlier times when we've been, you know, in diplomatic conversations with the Chinese quite intensively, you don't get these deltas because you have an ongoing conversation about what you're doing. It's much clearer to the each side what the intentions of the other side is because they are talking to lots of people and they're working on making progress on certain issues. And I think um, the absence of communication has really uh, fostered this kind of climate of I mean, it's not even mistrust or skepticism. It's downright uh, kind of disbelief in anything the other side says. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Um, you are an advocate of cooperation with China. So how do you respond to those like John Mearsheimer, for example, who argue that it was this policy of engagement over the years that led to China's arise in this ensuing period of dangerous tension? Huh, well, I mean, John Mearsheimer and other kind of international relations theorists have written a lot about, you know, US-China relations. Of course, he's also quite famously written a lot about US-Russia relations and the Ukraine war. Um, and, you know, I've taken issue with Mearsheimer's analysis, um, you know, in, in public, in foreign affairs, and at various, you know, uh, venues where I've been on panels with him. Um, and basically, you know, I've been working as a actual, like, participant in diplomacy um, and seeing kind of the realities and the hard work that goes in, the sort of shoe leather stuff that we do to try to make progress on issues in, with, with diplomatic partners, but also in various international settings, multilateral settings, et cetera. Um, you know, Mearsheimer sees the world in quite, I would say, black and white terms. Um, I see a lot of shades of gray. Uh, he, you know, would say that the international system is marked by sort of um, anarchy and each country trying to maximize their power in the system in order to pursue their national interests. He would say that probably war between the U.S. and China or some kind of uh, major conflict is inevitable because of the inevitable clash of sort of a, a of a rising power with a status quo power. These are things that Graham Allison at Harvard has also written about, although I think Graham Allison tries to make the case that there's less inevitability there. Um, you know, I see uh, the potential for a conflict as being um, radically avoidable, <laughs> I guess, and I hope it will be avoided. Um, and I think there's a lot in uh, diplomacy and international relations and international institutions, processes, habits of cooperation that we can lean on to try to, um, you know, foster a more balanced approach to international affairs that would be more beneficial to the United States over the long run. Um, and, you know, I've seen this work in practice. I've been in diplomacy with China where we have made progress on all kinds of issues. Um, it takes a long time. It's not easy. Their system does not match up well with ours. But I think uh, the notion uh, that a lot of people now have in the U.S. political elite that somehow we can uh, 
have an approach that will systematically weaken China, or maybe even as you hear when you listen to things like the House Select Committee on Strategic Competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party, um, there seems to be an undercurrent of thinking that we could force a regime change on China. I mean, this kind of thing is just, it's not um, realistic. It's not in our interest. And it's not going to lead us to a good place in the end. So well, are there areas that you see of potential cooperation in this climate? You know, anything, you know, whether it's maybe not done directly by governments, but you track two or something. Do, do you see areas for potential cooperation right now? Um, you know, I, I think that as the leader of the so-called containment policy toward China, and I do believe that that is what the U.S. is prosecuting. And if you hear U.S. government officials talk about it, that is precisely what they're saying. Um, I don't think as the leader of that policy that there's going to be a lot of room for bilateral discussion or cooperation between the U.S. and China, because um, basically the U.S. has marked out China as a as an adversary, and we're prosecuting a kind of Cold War type policy to isolate and contain them. And I don't think the Chinese are going uh, to be convinced to engage with us on that basis, frankly. But I do think there are a lot of areas where we will cooperate with China in multilateral fora. And you've seen this happen recently. There was a negotiation over a UN treaty on the high seas where U.S. and Chinese delegates, you know, both worked together or maybe separately, but in parallel to get that treaty across the finish line recently. Um, there are a lot of uh, efforts like that that are parallel in various areas. I would say probably climate change at this point. There's no real bilateral discussion on climate change between the U.S. and China at the moment, but nevertheless, we'll still end up meeting in multilateral venues, um, you know, surrounding the Paris Climate Accords, and we'll be hopefully working each of us toward making progress on those issues in our parallel tracks. Um, and of course, then there's the obvious area um, of, of commercial cooperation and trade. I mean, last year, US-China trade um, hit a new record high. So in spite of all of the sanctions and recriminations and and spy balloons and other um you know negative things happening with tensions in the Taiwan Strait uh we still managed to keep you know commercial relations going and um you know that's an area i would say to watch carefully because there are a lot of efforts ongoing uh with respect to uh, i would say targeted decoupling but it's hard to know how far they'll go and how they'll be limited. So I think that's um, an important area to watch. And, and I would say there's a lot going on too um, with other countries. We shouldn't forget about that, right? You mentioned in your opening that China brokered, I mean, I, I think this is quite significant and very surprising actually that China brokered this agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which will have, if it if it works, if it's durable, it will have the effect of uh, bringing stability, more stability to the Middle East, which is, of course, in the United States interest and in the interests of everyone. Um, and, you know, China has not typically gotten involved in brokering uh, these kinds of, um, you know, peace agreements between countries that are sort of far from their own borders. And so um, if this is a new trend that China will get more involved in sort of managing the global system, that is in fact what we had sought um, in the early part of this century uh, in our relations with China to get them to step up and do more in these kinds of areas. And that was um, you know, uh, contained in the sentiment that was put out by Robert Zellick under the George W. Bush administration about we want China to become a responsible stakeholder. There was a sense then that China was a sort of a free rider on the international system, and we want them to, um, you know, be in the international system, but also strengthen and support the international system more. 
And um, so now that they're doing it, of course, I think we were not uh, we were not super enthusiastic in our reception for this recent agreement, but um, and there's a lot of talk about China replacing the U.S.'s influence in the Middle East, et cetera. But I think um, pretty much any way you look at this agreement, it's it's a it's a good thing. So um, you know, it's I, I'm not so happy with the U.S. being so ungenerous in its responses to some of these unalterably sort of good things that happen, but. Um, and I don't think that's a good look for U.S. diplomacy, frankly. I don't think it helps our influence in the Middle East to be sort of negative about this agreement. But um, I think you'll see China doing more of these kinds of things that don't involve uh, the United States, that they can step out on their own and do more on the diplomatic stage. Thank you. Yes, um, you, you just mentioned the international system. So I'd love to stay on that point for a little bit. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, the U.S.-China relationship does not happen in a vacuum. Um, what impact does the dynamic between the United States and China have on the international system and multilateral diplomacy? And conversely, how do you see international systems and bilateral relationships impacting the contours of the U.S.-China dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for your listeners to sort of think about this important question, um, because you know the international system has been in flux over basically my career. Um, I grew up in a bipolar system during the Cold War, the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union, and of course it was then that Nixon made the opening to China in order to basically bring China in on our side against the Soviet Union. And no one disputes, I don't think, at this point that that was a, um, you know, a very good strategy and a positive one for the United States and paid big dividends. Um, then after the, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, um, you know, we moved to a unipolar international system where the U.S. was such an outsized power that it could basically um, do what it wanted. It, there were very few constraints on U.S. power after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Of course, during the Cold War, there were constraints. We had all these arms control agreements. People talk about them now in the context of China, but these were constraints on U.S. power um, and other kinds of arrangements that we had um, in this bipolar system that um, assured that we wouldn't hopefully, um, you know, mutually destroy one another, right? But in the 90s, we moved to this unipolar system. Um, the U.S. was the undisputed pole in the system. And, you know, we saw over uh, the course of three decades, kind of that unconstrained power at work in the system. So we saw the proliferation of kind of um, wars of choice, if you will, um, you know, unilateral uh, kinds of moves on the part of the United States in terms of sanctions and other things proliferating. Uh, of course, we prosecuted the Great War on Terror um, and wars in Iraq and Afghanistan during that time. And um, now I think um, part of what we see in the U.S. response to China uh, is a function of the realization, maybe not explicitly stated in the U.S., that the world is moving into a new stage. And many academics and people in other countries talk about this post-post-Cold War world and post-post-Cold War international system and the move to a more multipolar system. Um, which is definitely happening. Uh, and it's something that I think U.S. politicians are having a very hard time grappling with because it means, obviously, um, that um, the U.S. unconstrained power and unipolar system is transitioning to something where the United States is going to have less power in that system. And that is a very hard thing for politicians to coin a narrative for that seems positive in our in our democratic system. So, you know, I think um, this is very difficult for us to do. I think uh, China, you know, could have played this a lot smarter 
in when I was in Beijing in the embassy in the early 2000s, um, there was a prominent academic who was an advisor to then President Hu Jintao, who coined the phrase China's peaceful rise. Now, there was a lot of derision around it from Americans at the time saying, you know, haha, China's not peaceful. But the idea behind the slogan was that there was a realization that China's rise was going to be seen as threatening, particularly to the U.S., but probably to other countries in the Asia Pacific region as well, and that China should be humble and careful um, to you know, rise in a way that was not going to attract a lot of attention and, um, you know, fear. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, when Xi Jinping came into power, um, you know, he really abandoned that sort of notion that China should be more humble, should be careful, um, and was quite, you know, impatient and aggressive about uh, pursuing China's sort of newfound place in the international system and on the global stage. Um, I probably am more skeptical about uh, efforts by China to export its system and things like that than some other um, people who, who see China in a much more threatening light, uh, probably because I spent a lot of time there. I think China faces a lot of challenges. I think we are overestimating the danger from China. But you can see how in this sort of dynamic in moving toward a multipolar system where other countries are also, you know, rising and want more say in the system. And here the U.S. has had sort of this, you know, carte blanche to do what it wanted for 30 years. Uh, making this transition is going to be pretty tricky. All right, I'll try to get in one last question before going to the Q&A. And if you're listening, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box and I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. So if you had a magic wand, what would you do? What would your priorities <laughs> be? <laughs> yeah, um, this is a really hard question because we're at such a bad place right now in U.S.-China relations. Um, the most important thing, and people talk about it in the Biden administration and even in Congress, although I'm not sure in Congress they really mean it, but um, the most important thing is to avoid a war with China, obviously, because it would be uh, catastrophic, um, not just for uh, China, but for the U.S. and for the rest of the world and certainly all the countries in the region. And everybody wants to avoid this. The most important and most likely place, um, and maybe the only, actually, the only likely place for a conflict between the United States and China is over Taiwan. And we haven't talked much about that, but if I could wave a magic wand and uh, do one thing, it would be to try to um, fix or take down the level of provocative, uh, unnecessary kind of interactions that are happening right now in the Taiwan Strait, both coming from the US, um, but also coming from China. And the way I think we would have to do that would be um, probably politically impossible in the United States, but we would have to try to ratchet back some of the more adventurous kinds of um, actions that we're taking under our uh, approach to Taiwan and move back into the framework of a one China policy that we've had since basically since Nixon's visit to China and since Henry Kissinger negotiated the Shanghai communique with the Chinese. I think um, it would be very hard to do now because we've gone pretty far beyond it. Uh, but I think um, people in the United States really don't understand how provocative, how threatening what we're doing right now with respect to Taiwan is seen in China. And I think this is really important to have people understand in the context of the current you know, war in Ukraine and how we got there. Um, obviously, you know, this is something that is just 
incomprehensible how Russia could invade Ukraine and bomb it so brutally. And, um, you know, there's no um, excuse for Vladimir Putin having done this, but um, problems with Russia have been building up for such a long time. And people who I think understand Russia's paranoia and security fears um, let's just say we're not surprised <laughs> to see that Russia would would ha harbor such extreme feelings about Ukraine. And so, you know, we have to, even if we think they're wrong, we have to appreciate how other countries are looking at their own security situations. And we have to, uh, you know, take their concerns seriously or we may end up in a situation that we really didn't didn't um, design and didn't want to be in. Very good point. Um, I'm turning to the Q&A now. And one of our first questions is, what do you think is the main motivation of US hostility towards China? Hmm. Well, I think basically we're afraid. <laughs> I think we're afraid. We're afraid of losing our uh, primacy in the international system. We're afraid that China is um, a juggernaut that's on the march and is going to displace a lot of our economic activities. Uh, we're afraid that they're building up a modern military that is going to be a challenge to our military and may you know, as countries develop, I mean, you can say if you're China that I'm going to have a peaceful rise, but you have a huge military under arms, you're developing modern weapons, you're getting more powerful, and with increasing power come increasing ambitions. And no one in China can convincingly tell you that they're not going to, um, you know, move to protect their interests with their military as they perceive them in the future. And that may very well end up being in, in sort of contradistinction to the interests of the US and our allies in the region. And certainly, I mean, the issue of Taiwan is a huge problem in US-China relations. It's always been a huge problem in US-China relations. And people, you know, managing the relationship have always been very careful about this issue because they have known it was the one place where we can get into a conflict. Unfortunately, in the last five years, I would have to say that the careful management of this issue has been dropped and we have been using it as a kind of um, uh, a cudgel, if you will, in the U.S.-China relationship, which has deteriorated. And I think this is extremely dangerous for Taiwan, especially, uh, but also for the United States and China and the rest of the world. So um, that's the one area that I think people should pay most attention to. Great, thank you. Um... The next question. So there, uh, the questioner writes, there is an interesting article in Foreign Affairs, the March of April issue by Kishore Mabubani that suggests that the U.S. could learn from ASEAN in how to deal with China and that the U.S. containment policy is a mistake and that continuously trying to thwart China's desire to be a major actor on the international stage is wrongheaded and counterproductive, I think, as you've uh, outlined. So um, it sounds like you're familiar with this basic premise, but w uh, of the idea of this being counterproductive. What do you think about the piece, you know, how we could learn from ASEAN? So this kind of goes back to what you're saying earlier about, you know, reliance on multilateral and other institutions. Huh. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the real difference between the way ASEAN views China and the way the U.S. views China is that, first of all, the ASEANs have a much greater familiarity with China, Chinese culture, its system. Many of these countries have huge Chinese um, populations living in them. Uh, and so they have really complicated relations with China and they see the region as very complex and having shades of gray. I mean, some of the countries in ASEAN are democracies. 
some of them, like Vietnam, are run by the Vietnamese Communist Party. Um, some are, you know, we would call them probably authoritarians. Um, and so they exist in a milieu that is quite, if not comfortable, at least accepting of the reality that there's a, you know, mixture of, of forces at work and that they have to adapt and I think the difference really with respect to China is that they understand that China is not going to just give in to US pressure. I mean, I think this is the big mistake that we're making. Um, we appear to have embarked on a policy that is focused on sort of weakening China's influence, weakening its economy, weakening, you know, blocking its development, thinking that China is going to somehow you know, either the regime will collapse, which I, you know, am quite skeptical about, or that um, somehow they will back down, give in, et cetera. I mean, and I think, you know, people who know anything about China, the Chinese government, the Chinese people are just quite skeptical about that premise. Um, we seem to think we can force them to move in a different direction. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's only <laughs> making them more determined. We have a couple of questions about uh, Russia, China. So one person is asking whether China will supply lethal weapons to Russia at any point in the future, sort of what your take is um, on that. And then someone else just asking, what do you think about the future of Russia-China cooperation in geopolitics? Yeah, these are really important questions, and um, there's a lot of different opinions about this. Um, you know, I've lived and worked in Russia, and I've lived and worked in China for a long time, and I've studied their relationship and speak both languages. I um, think that the prospects for very close Russia-China cooperation are uh, limited, but, you know, they certainly share at this point, you know, a common, let's say, enemy in the United States. They see the U.S. as determined to undermine their security and their economy and their country and their leadership. So that gives them a lot of common cause, um, probably more now than ever before, because they both feel that it's become starkly apparent that this is the case. So so that's um, number one. Number two, they both feel that the international system needs to move away from this unipolar system of unconstrained U.S. power um, to something where they, the two of them especially probably, but other countries too, have more of a voice and a say in how things function. And that gives them common cause probably more now than ever before, given that they're both facing extremely you know, dire sanctions, Russia more than China, but China, we keep putting more sanctions on every day, it seems. So these, these are things that they um, fiercely object to and wanna see changed. Um, there are a number of other things about the international system that they both wanna see changed. They have quite symbiotic economies so Russia is a natural resource provider. China is very short of natural resources. China produces a lot of manufactured goods. Russia doesn't. So there is quite a lot of uh, symbiosis there. On the question of providing, um, oh, and I should mention also they're increasing military cooperation, although I think that has pretty serious limits because in the end, the two really <laughs> don't trust each other much and they, um, are kind of rivals on the same uh, very large landmass, and they exist coexist uh, somewhat uncomfortably next to one another. Um, but they are uh, having increasing military cooperation. You see increased uh, exercises, joint patrols, etc., um, and sales of Russian equipment to China before this war in Ukraine broke out. Um, we're, we're also increasing in significance. Um, the Chinese providing lethal uh, weapons to Russia, 
China doesn't really want to become embroiled in this conflict in Ukraine. Um, they don't want to become embroiled because they're uncomfortable with it. They don't want to become embroiled because they don't want to become embroiled. And this is their usual position on such conflicts. Um, and they also know that, you know, Europe and the U.S. especially, but also others are are watching and it has to do with their credibility in the international system. They do pretend to stand for principles as outlined in the UN Charter. They do oppose violations of you know, sovereign territory. They supported the US when we um, threw Iraq out of Kuwait in the 1991 Gulf War. Um, and so they do um, you know, like to see themselves as being a responsible actor on the global stage. That said, there is a lot of trade between Russia and China right now, obviously, um, and it's increasing because Russia has now such limited prospective partners and China's taking advantage of the market that's now opened up to them that may have not been there before. And I think it will be uh, not surprising if we find in all this trade that there is something that goes from China to Russia. I don't think it'll be because the Chinese government wants to supply Russia with lethal weapons. I think they'll try to avoid that. But that doesn't mean that something won't go there and that we'll find it and that it will become a big issue. That's sort of what I foresee happening. Great, great question. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about demographics now. And uh, they're asking, can you address the effect of China's aging, shrinking population, partly the byproduct of the one child policy on the country's ambitions for a modern military and increasing global influence? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. I mean, so China's had this one China policy since um, Deng Xiaoping, uh, you know, in the early 80s. Um, they have now rescinded it, of course, but nobody <laughs> seemingly in China, at least in the big cities, really wants to have many children. So they're really facing a, a crunch. Um, you know, I don't know whether that will change going forward. But the thing that analysts sort of cite is the shrinking labor force that they're already seeing. I mean, we saw the first um, population actual decline in China registered last year. But, you know, this is really kind of a longer term phenomenon. So, you know, you have to think about the things that people say with respect to China in terms of what's short term, what's medium term, and what's long term. And I think this is really a long term issue. Um, I also think that what we should not lose sight of is that China has still a huge population that is not productively employed. And um, they can get a lot of productivity gains by investing in human capital. Um, so that that can make up for some of the shortfall that we we see. So we don't know how much that can make up. China also has a lot of plans for displacing human, you know, labor and um, with with automation, with technology. So that also will play out in the future. So I think the point that a lot of people raise is, you know, there will be a lot of resources going into taking care of the elderly population in China. That's true. It's true of a lot of societies. Um, you know, they see Japan next door, they know what that looks like. But I think they are thinking that they can, um, you know, invest in their remaining underemployed population and invest in technology that will, that will help fill some of that gap. And then long term, uh, um, we'll just have to see how it how it plays out. I mean, they're obviously always going to be a populous country. Um, but, you know, how how it plays out in terms of their economy going forward is is interesting. And the military part of this is also important because, of course, there are a lot of only children um, in in the Chinese military, um, many, many sons, only children, sons of many, many families in China. And the question has often come up whether that's a uh, a drag or some kind of obstacle um, or whether it figures in the Chinese propensity to move to conflict. I will say that China's um, sort of mantra in 
its uh, military strategy coming from uh, Sun Tzu, its ancient sort of war theoretician, is that um, the idea should be to win without fighting. And that is something that I think you'll hear most um, Chinese military theorists talk about. And with respect to Taiwan, I'm sure that that's their strategy, although it doesn't mean that they wouldn't fight if they thought they had to. But um, I think they would certainly like to avoid having to do so. We talked a little bit about the rhetoric in the US. Um, and we have a question here that's asking, what do you think is the main reason that leads to the change of thinking of most political elites in China that they're becoming more aggressive and belligerent, um, considering that China has not been involved in a major war since the 1980s, and they've basically not established many military bases in different parts of the world. So is there a change in thinking in the political elite in China? And if so, what do you think is the reason for that? It's a really good question and very hard to answer, but I will try. Um, you know, my first comment would be that they shouldn't have changed their thinking. They should have just kept with the old uh, approach of, you know, methodically, meticulously building up their economy, um, you know, um, sort of, you know, building up their military, but not being aggressive about it. And, um, you know, eventually over time, that would have been a good strategy. And why get impatient? You know, you're a civilization of with thousands of years of history, you're you're famous for being more patient than certainly the United States, but most other countries. Why did you abandon that? Um, I, so I think um, really the explanation comes from a couple of things, um, and most of them have to do with domestic factors in China. So you know the Communist Party of China. Um, I think we all know their number one goal is to keep the Communist Party of China in power. And it is something that they are quite paranoid about and worried about. And they're extremely focused on internal domestic stability and uh, unity and the legitimacy of the governance of the Chinese Communist Party and shoring that up at all costs. And so, you know, one, what are the things that um, give legitimacy to the Communist Party's rule. You know, an appointed set of, um, if you want to believe one version, meritocratic kind of bureaucrats to run the country. Another side would say it's kind of political cronyism. But in any case, what what gives them legitimacy to run China? Um, you know, it's performance. So they've delivered economic growth, um, and it's also, I would say, nationalism. And, you know, when things start to falter on the economic growth side and China's growth has been slowing, they've run into a lot of societal problems. They've run into a lot of entrenched interests that prevent them from being able to deal with these societal problems. Uh, reforms have really run into a roadblock. And, you know, in the face of maybe deteriorating prospects for legitimacy for your party's rule, you think that pumping up nationalism or, you know, responding in a way that's more muscular to outside pressures and provocations is a way to pump up legitimacy in China. And I think it's also important for Americans to recognize that um, there are things that you know, the U.S. has done over the years that sort of put more pressure on China. As China's power has been growing, we've been getting gradually more uncomfortable with it. You know, we've been pressuring militarily. We, we've seen a few crises erupt over things like this in the, over the years. We had a Taiwan Strait crisis in the 90s. We had a bombing of the Yugoslav em embassy, the Chinese embassy. We had um, a spy plane uh, collide with a, a Chinese fighter jet off the Chinese coast. And there was a lot of, um, you know, um, nervousness about what that was going to lead to. We've managed to, you know, put all these crises somehow eventually um, behind us. But, you know, there are a lot of things that have been building up on Taiwan in particular, um, in particular in the Western Pacific with China's rising military power and the rising sort of worrying about 
China's military power on the part of the US military, a lot of interactions between ships and planes in that region. And, you know, all of this, um, especially since it's so public, because the US tends to publicize everything, causes the Chinese to need to respond publicly. Um, as they've sort of built up this kind of nationalist undercurrent that supports the Chinese Communist Party. So, you know, Xi Jinping come, comes into power. He says he's going to pursue, um, you know, Chinese rejuvenation, um, you know, bringing China back to its rightful place in the in, in Asia as the as a as a global leading power. Um, you know, closer to the center of the global stage, all of this, which is an appeal certainly to, um, you know, not just nationalists in China, but to everyone in China who knows the history, um, which is that China was, you know, strong for thousands of years and was the center of civilization and then, you know, was was weakened and carved up by outside powers and is now throwing off that mantle and, and uh, coming back. Of course, there's a lot of politics involved in this, et cetera, but um, I think that's the basic, um, you know, explanation for how we got to where we are. Thank you. Um, regarding Taiwan, we have a question. What is the US concern over Taiwan's production of microchips? Is it as much as over democracy? Um, so, so, what, what's your take this on that? This is a very important <laughs> question, and I hope there will be more discussion in, you know, American circles about what is the U.S. interest in Taiwan, um, given that, you know, we are on a course, I would say at the moment, um, for a collision between the U.S. and China over, over Taiwan. We should really be talking much more prominently in public about what are the US interests in Taiwan. Um, I don't really subscribe to this notion that, you know, Taiwan's production of semiconductors is really the main US interest in supporting Taiwan or defending Taiwan, um, because really this issue has not been mentioned as, you know, a central theme of our engagement with Taiwan until maybe the last two years. Um, and we have had ever since 1979 legislation on the books that basically obligates us to um, ensure that Taiwan has sufficient defense capability to defend itself. Um, and so obviously there's been an interest in Taiwan for the United States going all the way back you know, to the normalization agreement, et cetera. Um, you know, it's been now, <laughs> you know, 40 years or more since that, almost 45 since the normalization agreement. And obviously U.S. interests with respect to Taiwan have changed. Um, but I think the basic <laughs> formula about our interests and why we are so uh, determined uh, to support Taiwan is the same as it was then, um, which is that, you know, it has to do with U.S. credibility, the U.S. position in Asia. Um, Taiwan is not a treaty ally. We don't have a defense um, obligation to Taiwan. We were uh, part of the normalization agreement was that we we abrogated our defense, mutual defense treaty or our defense arrangement with Taiwan. We agreed to withdraw U.S. troops from Taiwan. Um, we agreed to pursue um, what we called then the one China policy, which wasn't completely what China wanted, but it was enough for them to be able to paper over our differences and proceed with normalizing our relations. That difference is at the heart of the problems that we've had over this issue ever since. But one of the things the US promised was to not have official relations with Taiwan, um, which is where you, know, you see some of the problems recently uh, coming into play. You know, how do you define an official relationship um, it wasn't really completely spelled out at the time. Uh, the Chinese think they have a reasonable assessment of what official is, and we beg to differ. So that's one problem. But the interest in Taiwan um, 
it has to do with, you know, history. Um, we were, you know, allied with the Republic of China during the Second World War. Um, as a result of the Chinese Civil War, that ally fled basically to Taiwan um, to hold out as, you know, long as possible in the Chinese Civil War. Um, obviously, the Chinese Communist Party won the Civil War and they've never gone and tried to reclaim Taiwan. So there we sit with two different governments. Um, there's a long, long history here. But I think in the end of the day, the idea now about the U.S. interest in Taiwan is that it's a useful, um, it's a useful chip, I guess, or a piece on a chessboard in our current strategic competition with China. And that is new. I mean, that has been something that the Chinese have worried about over the years, that Taiwan has worried about over the years. But I would say it really, the U.S. really did not see Taiwan as a, as a bargaining chip in sort of a strategic competition with China until, until recently. Um, it was more um, that we supported its democracy, its democratic development, which, which came about in the 90s. Um, and we support it as a vibrant kind of uh, independent, sort of de facto independent entity, but we don't, um, you know, we don't have a defense treaty with it or we don't have an obligation there. So, um, you know, I think it's really complicated and it's really important that we think about this. Of course, Japan, which was the former colonial um, occupier of Taiwan from 1895 to the end of World War II has a very big interest in Taiwan as well. And of course, Japan is a close ally of the United States. Um, their Southwest islands are very close to Taiwan. So they uh, view the Taiwan issue as a security issue. Uh, and it's becoming increasingly clear that the US and Japan um, are no longer necessarily accepting of a peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue where Taiwan would be recovered somehow by China. And I think that's really a huge change that's happened in the last five years. All right, great, thank you. So and just a reminder to everyone, we have uh, 15 minutes more because this is a slightly longer session because it's part of our deep dive. So I'm gonna to try to get in a couple more questions and we have some good ones here. Um, and thank you to everyone who's putting a Q&A into the Q&A box. Um, so one person's asking, how do you see the prospects for continued scientific, scholarly and humanitarian slash NGO cooperation going forward? Yeah, um, I'm quite worried about that. And, you know, it gets back to the question that you asked, Courtney, is sort of what, what are the prospects for U.S.-China cooperation? Um, because, you know, I see a lot of confusion in U.S. discourse about you know, what are the threats that China poses? Um, what are the reasonable responses? Um, what is the prioritization of, of problems that China poses? And because everything's being sort of mixed together in for a lot of times it's political expediency, let's be clear. Um, you know, almost everything related to China is being tarred with this kind of uh, very nationalistic, I would say, brush, and including, um, unfortunately, things like scientific cooperation, you know, even in like medical research fields is really um, feeling a lot of pressure. And you know, this doesn't get discussed enough, but I think it's become so hard for us to, <coughs> excuse me, um, compartmentalize things respecting with respect to China. <coughs> and I think there's a lot of questions that are now being raised about 
um, non-governmental groups, you know, talking to Chinese groups. Um, if you listen to the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party hearing, um, I thought it was quite shocking when there were a couple of people who stood up in the uh, hearing room and were protesting, you know, the hearing saying, and they held up signs saying, you know, China is not our enemy, stop Asian hate. And these were people from an organization that <laughs> many of us who have been in hearing rooms <clears throat> are familiar with, they're Code Pink, which is a sort of an anti-war protest organization in the U.S., and, and they often show up on, in hearings on Capitol Hill. But um, after they stood up and protested, um, General McMaster, who was one of the witnesses at the hearing, said to the hearing room that, oh, these people must have been influenced by the Chinese United Front Work Department. Um, which was shocking to me because protesting in the United States is one of our constitutional rights. It's quite uh, reasonable and hopefully um, desirable for people to have different opinions in the United States and to be able to voice them and protest about them if they want to. And so the notion that if you have a different opinion than the one that was being voiced in the hearing room, you must be influenced by the Chinese United Front Work Department um, is, is really um, a dangerous notion, I think. And I was pretty shocked to hear it from General McMaster, actually. Um, but it just shows you the extent to which this has become a kind of a vogue invocation. And I think it's really important for thoughtful people to stand up and say, you know, this is this is not the way we in America, uh, you know, go about um, our work. It's not the way we go about our relationships. It's not the way we go about treating our own citizens. Um, and certainly we shouldn't uh, treat uh, people in general um, with this kind of cavalier sort of broad brush, you know, um, anti kind of kind of attitude in my in my view. Um, going back to the international system, we have a question here that uh, the questioner is asking, if tensions between the US, you know, uh, in front of these Western countries um, and China rise concerning democratic principles um, over Taiwan and supporting Russia in the uh, war in Ukraine, do you think that China could establish a parallel international system? So, so it, you know, the way I read this question is, you know, is this rhetoric over democratic principles, is it going to lead to some sort of divide within the international system? Hmm. Um, there is a lot of rhetoric in the United States that says that China wants to create an, an inter, its own international system or to take over the current international system or to create a parallel international system. Um, you know, there are some indications um, of China doing that, particularly in areas where they have been pressing for changes, have been rebuffed and have and have the wherewithal to go out on their own. So one um, good example of this is in the in the development economics area, they created their own uh, international development bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, when they could not get um, increased voting shares in, say, the World Bank or in the Asian Development Bank, which is headed by Japan. Um, and, you know, they saw a need and they wanted to um, put money into this area. And so they went ahead and developed a separate institution. The U.S. Uh, opposed it. Uh, all of our allies and partners, except for Japan, joined it. And there it is. It's operating now. Um, they also started a, you know, a sort of a um, non-multilateral, sort of a bilateral lending program through the Belt and Road Initiative, which has created a lot of concern in the United States. 
Um, I saw an article recently that the Chinese put out about wanting to multilateralize the Belt and Road Initiative as well. I mean, what this speaks to is that the Chinese have a lot of funding for this kind of thing, and they think it's important. And the U.S. and other developed countries have really gone away from funding infrastructure in recent years. So we've kind of left an open field and China uh, has filled it, not successfully in my view, because they've invested in a lot of you know, non-productive assets and, and projects, but some of them have gone well and some countries like them. Um, but that's one area where they've gone about sort of trying to create um, their own thing. I would say though, in general, uh, their rhetoric has been pretty consistent that they want an international system centered on the UN charter and UN principles. And that's the system that they are gonna support and try to, um, bring to fruition. They feel that it's not being uh, implemented in part because of this sort of unipolar phenomenon that I talked about earlier, and they want to see it um, implemented in um, a way that, you know, that they find would be more compatible with their interests or with the interests of the developing world, um, and they don't like parts of it. Um, they are not members of the International Criminal Court, probably for the same reasons that we are not members of the International Criminal Court, um, but they don't like uh, other countries interfering in the jurisdiction of China with respect to how they want to govern themselves. And this, you know, is a big point of disagreement between us. But in general, I would say um, there are changes that China wants to see to the international system. There are areas where they can go off on their own, and they have, and they probably would continue to do that, probably mostly in economic areas. Uh, but for the most part, they support uh, the UN system and UN agreements. They like multilateralism. They want more multilateralism, not less. And um, they don't really, you know, this is where I differ from some people in the Biden administration. They don't really want to be the leader of the international system. They don't want to be responsible uh, for all of that. They are very focused on themselves, their own development. They're quite, you know, in this respect, I would say self-centered. And the worries about China sort of taking over the international system and leading it in a direction that we don't like, I think is pretty far-fetched. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'll try to get in a couple more questions. We have uh, one here that's asking about your assessment of the State Department's personnel when it comes to our capacity to both engage with China as well as, in this, in specifically in this question, um, engaging in identifying mutual interests of China's distrustful neighbors. So um, where, where's the State Department's capacity? right now? Hmm. Um, so Courtney, you may actually have a different <laughs> view on this than I do. I don't think the State Department's problem is lack of resources. I think our problem is policy and politics. Um, I think we, in our political system right now, devalue diplomacy, compromise, negotiations. Um, this is probably a function of this unipolar <laughs> uh, period that I talked about where we've sort of gotten used to throwing our weight around and being able to just be the demandeur and get what we want. Uh, you know, negotiations take a long time. It's incremental. It's not sexy. And, you know, the agreements that you get after a negotiation are not, um, you know, everything that you wanted usually, because usually a negotiation is a, is a brokered compromise. So, you know, we've really gone away from valuing diplomacy in my view in the United States. Um, it's become kind of a, <laughs> a proxy for weakness uh, in our national character. And, you know, we see where it's gotten us. So, um, I hope that diplomacy will come back in vogue. I think it's much more dependent on um, our political culture and our our the evolution of our politics uh, than it is, you know, training of personnel or resources or anything else. And 
unfortunately, given where we are at the moment, I think it's going to take quite a lot of time. But I hope that there will start to be, you know, a demand signal among the American public to start, you know, bringing back reasonable discussion with other countries and diplomacy, et cetera. I mean, we 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 see that the Biden administration has gone a long way in reviving relations with our so-called partners and allies. They talk about that all the time, but it's pretty easy to do diplomacy with partners and allies. It's a lot harder to do it with, you know, countries that don't agree with you or are not, um, you know, on the same wavelength in terms of system or values. And, you know, that's where the challenging part comes in. And I think we would profit by devoting a lot more effort and time to figuring out how to make progress with with those elements. Great. Um, so to wrap it all up, what what are specific steps that the U.S. administration and China can take now to try to lower tensions? What, what are some of the top things you'd like to see from either side? Well, I think, um, you know, it is important to be able to have meetings, official meetings between the US and China without it becoming a political football every time. So in the normalization of regular official meetings is crucially important. And without that, we have no idea really what they're thinking. They have really no idea what's going on with us. And it's a very dangerous escalatory security dilemma that will lead to conflict. So that's uh, number one. I think that that is, you know, probably unfortunately far off. We've got an election cycle coming up, you know, in November, 2024, we'll have an election. Um, between now and then it's gonna be difficult. And um, after that, we don't know. So in the absence of constructive official discussions, I think it's really important that we try to keep up other connections. This is the most populous country in the world, the second largest economy. It's not going anywhere. We need to figure out how we're gonna coexist with China. Uh, we're not gonna defeat them. We're not gonna overturn their you know, government. We're not gonna invade them. Uh, you know, it's just, um, you know, my view kind of, nonsensical approach that we've embarked on, but we need to keep connections between people going, we need to keep connections between businesses going, um, and we need to, I, I think, um, you know, try to uh, find some areas in multilateral maybe talks where we can work together to solve some problems, because that's really the way that we're going to try to, that we're going to be able to sort of start to, you know, reestablish these habits of of working together and knowing what the other one is trying to do and that really right now i mean i think that the you know sort of big delta in understanding is 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 really really dangerous and damaging and so any way we can try to close that um in while we wait for the powers that be to get together and and talk big things is is important all right well, on that note, I hope I, I do hope to see your 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 vision of understanding and uh, no conflict prevail. So, uh, thank you Thanks. for this. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I I just want to say I commend everyone for taking um, the time and the extra time to listen to this. I think it's really important. Um, and please do share. We will have this on our YouTube channel after. So please feel free to share with friends and colleagues. I think the more we can have um, nuanced discussion around US-China relations, the better everything will be. So um, with that, just a couple of brief housekeeping items. Our next briefing, it's a member, oh, our next deep dive briefing is on Tuesday, March 28th. Um, and this is on how China can revive its economy with Yukon Huang. Uh, so please do register for that. This is one of the uh, publicly available briefings in the deep dive webinar. And then our next briefing that we have is a member only briefing and that's this Wednesday with Soner Chaaptai. Um, on the earthquake in Turkey and its ramifications for the upcoming elections. And then we also have a briefing on Thursday, and this is publicly available. Um, and it's about Iraq 20 years on and where there is hope for peace um, within the country. So please do RSVP for those. Um, and just one more note about the deep dive program. Again, uh, we have 
a whole slew of barcodes up here, but the ones on the far left, uh, the register for deep dives program on the top left, if you scan that, you will be basically registered for all of the upcoming webinars. If you just want to register for the next session, that's the one below. Um, and again, we're a nonprofit, so please feel free. We welcome donations to help keep these programs free and open to all. Um, so Susan, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your time and your vision. And uh, thank you everyone for listening.